Discovering Alabama is a production of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. Daybreak on the Warrior River. Rich with nature, the Warrior was a popular route of travel for early Indians. Today, a trip down the Warrior means a chance to experience these surroundings much the way the Indians did. And along the river just south of Tuscaloosa, it also means a chance to travel back in time. Rising from the flatland of a broad Warrior River terrace, the Indian mounds at Moundville, Alabama are dramatic reminders of a remarkable culture, a culture that grew from the bounty of this river valley and that drew much of its symbolism from the mysteries of the natural world around it. Despite nearly a century of scientific study, much of the saga of Moundville remains unknown. I'm Doug Phillips. Join me as we look at this still mysterious Indian culture and at the story of our efforts to unlock its secrets. This program is about a land unknown to many people, a land that in many ways has escaped the hustle and bustle of modern civilization, a place with bountiful backcountry, forests, streams, and wildlife more diverse than can be found in much of the inhabited world. Come along with me as we explore the natural wonders of this land. Come along as we discover Alabama. To the European explorers, America was the New World, but it was actually a world that had been inhabited far back in time. And in the centuries prior to European arrival, this was a magnificent chieftain, a chieftain that extended its influence over hundreds of miles and thousands of people. Today, it is the largest and best preserved Indian mound site in North America. It is also among the most intensively studied sites yielding an extraordinary collection of Indian artifacts. The customs and the lifestyle of this culture were far different from our own. But something important for us to realize, in several basic ways, the lives of these people were very close to ours. Like us, they witnessed the wonder of birth, of creation. They knew the joys of life and its celebration. And they faced the fear of death and bodily disintegration. And as they sought to make sense of it all, to make sense of the world around them, they came to believe in the powers of the sun and the earth for nurturance and regeneration.
Today we know the mounds as symbolic representations of the earth. Their flat tops, evidence of the Indian belief that the earth was flat. The four corners, evidence of their concept of four cardinal directions from which different natural or spiritual forces held influence on their lives. But this hasn't always been the popular interpretation of the mounds. For example, earlier theories held that the mounds were built by a lost civilization, a lost tribe from Israel or Egypt, from a faraway land of pyramids. Getting a clear picture of the truth about these mounds hasn't been easy. It's like assembling the pieces of a giant jigsaw puzzle. Only this puzzle requires the careful skills of a special kind of detective the kind known as an archaeologist. So the purpose of this excavation is to determine how many stages of construction there are in this mound and also to find out as much as we can about the purpose of the buildings that were on top of it. It's a nice truncated pyramid. This is Mount Q. And uh, we have certain ideas about what these buildings might have been, temples, for example. So we want to test that. The first thing we do then is to lay out our grid system so that we can run a trench in exactly perpendicular to one of these mound flanks. Once we get the information about how many mound stages there are and, and uh, where they are in the profile, we move up on top of the mound and begin to dig down to those actual buildings to uncover the actual foundations of the buildings if we can to tell some more about the function of the buildings. So this is just really the, the first 10-20% uh, of, of what this project is about. The methods of archaeology today are meticulously systematic, unlike those of Clarence B. Moore, who in 1905 conducted the first publicized studies of the mounds. A wealthy Philadelphian of independent means, Moore came up the Warrior River in his steamboat, the Gopher, well supplied and hoping to bag an impressive collection of Indian artifacts. His methods were typical of archaeology in its earliest phase, Nevertheless, his work yielded valuable information about the mounds, including the first published map of the site. Moore's probing of mound contents helped verify that the mounds were not built by some strange civilization from another part of the world, but by an aboriginal tribe of Indians. So the Indians that settled here were native to the southeastern region. But why did they pick this location as the center of their settlement? Part of the reason has to do with geography. North of Moundville is basically Appalachian Hill Country, extending across the northern portion of the state and beyond. South of Moundville is the East Gulf Coastal Plain, which goes all the way to the Gulf of Mexico. So it was here in the middle, in something of a transition zone, that the Indians chose to settle. the Indians found an ecotone, or a setting especially rich with a blend of natural features. They could hunt, fish, and gather plants and other materials from hardwood forests, grassy prairies, oxbow lakes, back swamps, and streams of several kinds. One of the most important attractions here for the Indians turns out to be this. The fertile soil of this river plateau was perfect for growing a variety of foods. Food was the basis of a chieftain's wealth, and Moundville was a very rich place. Apparently, the Indians here could produce and store enough food for several thousand people. It was a corn-growing society. Uh, right around 1000 AD, uh, corn became very important in the Moundville diet, uh, very, very suddenly, within just a few generations. We know that from the chemical bone studies. Um, they grew corn, not only that, but beans and squash. Uh, they still supported themselves to some degree by hunting, especially deer, to get the protein in their diet. In a society like this, people pay tribute to their leaders, and so there is a surplus stored in central places. Undoubtedly, Moundville had one of these central storehouses of food at, at many points in its history, where the local chief would have ga gained tribute from not only his supporters, but their supporters further out. In the 1920s, the rich soils of Moundville were once again being put to use for farming, but this time for cotton and cattle. And not by Indians, but by farmers with legal ownership and the machinery of an emerging industrial era. Thus the mounds were being threatened by the legitimate activities of the new landowners 
and by the constant pilfering of vandals. But then, in search of the secrets of the mounds, came the original archaeological adventurer named Jones. In his field clothes, Dr. Walter B. Jones bore a resemblance to the swashbuckling Indiana Jones of pop movie fame. But this Alabama Jones was a serious scientist, deeply committed to saving the mounds from destruction. In a 1929 appeal to encourage protection for the mounds, Jones wrote, This matter has been up before state and federal legislative bodies time and again, and has never made any headway. In the meantime, the mounds are slowly disintegrating. We robbed the Indians of everything they had, and the least we can do is to preserve this wonderful monument which they left behind. Jones' efforts were rewarded when in 1938, the Moundville site gained full protection as a state monument. Walter Jones did have one thing in common with Indiana Jones, a connection with movie making. Only the movie was not Temple of Doom. And it was not Walter Jones with an on-camera role, but his wife Hazel, who portrays a native Indian paddling to the shores of the Mound Village. Fortunately, this would not be the final story of the Moundville Indians. Walter Jones would preside over a second phase of archaeology at Moundville, one of the biggest digs in history. During the 1930s, the Alabama State Museum of Natural History excavated almost 500,000 square feet of the Moundville site. With help from the Civilian Conservation Corps and others, they discovered the remains of 3,000 burials, 75 Indian houses, a million fragments of pottery, and thousands of other artifacts, tools, weapons, and many items of religious and artistic expression. Precise grids, meticulous notes, development of complete profiles. This phase of study marked the inauguration of true scientific archaeology at Moundville and contributed greatly to our knowledge of the Moundville Indian culture. In some of the old pictures of Moundville, you see small lakes or ponds here and there amongst the mounds. This is one of those ponds. Originally, it wasn't a pond of water, but just a big hole. It's called a borrow pit. The Indians borrowed dirt from here to build the mound there. And it took a lot of dirt. The tallest mound out here is roughly 60 feet high and contains 4 million cubic feet of earth. This fact, together with much of the evidence from the 1930s excavations, indicate that the Moundville Indians were highly organized. It was a hierarchical society. There were farmers and traders, warriors and chiefs, artists and construction workers. In short, here we had a bustling town, a center for trade and commerce, and the capital of a chiefdom that stretched its influence across the southeast. Archaeologists identified this society as part of the Mississippian period of Indian culture and have several theories about its origins and its presence here at Moundville. The Moundville site, as far as we know, was established around 900 A.D. within the late Woodland period. The origin of Moundville is still a matter of some dispute. Archaeologists have been batting this back and forth for a long time. Until fairly recently, it was believed that uh, Moundville was the result of a migration of people out of the central Mississippi Valley. But very, very gradually, as we learn more about this site, that theory's sort of fallen by the wayside, and we're beginning to look at things closer to home, over in the Tom Bigby Valley, let's say about 700 A.D. to 1,000 A.D., 
human health was, was going downhill, probably as a result of people having bad nutrition. People were generally unhealthy. They were overpopulated. There was a lot of warfare going on, a lot of competition. And that kind of creates a cauldron of activity that, that might cause people to, to do new things. It might cause people to move to an adjacent river valley in large groups and set up shop. It might cause people to establish a large site uh, to defend themselves from some of the warfare that was going on. By 1300 A.D., a little more than 500 years from the first settlement, the Moundville chieftain was at the height of its power and wealth. The Warrior Valley was densely populated, and the people who lived here were healthy and prosperous. Now, the Moundville Indians left behind no written record, but our best interpretation of the archaeological evidence tells us they had a complex system of faith and beliefs. Much of this evidence is pottery, pottery of unrivaled craftsmanship, and a number of designs and effigies that appear consistently at Indian sites of the Mississippian period. Experts feel that these designs are evidence of beliefs in the powers of the natural and the supernatural, that the Indians invoke such powers for help in battle, for success with crops, for bodily health and spiritual guidance. Apparently, the Indians acknowledged the interplay of the natural and the supernatural through cult rituals, an aspect of their society reflected in the mounds as well. We now feel the greater significance has to do not so much with the mounds themselves, but with the ritual of mound building. This ritual echoed the natural cycles of life, death, decay, and regeneration. The mounds were lived on, the surface cleansed and covered with a new layer, and lived on again. Thus the mounds were built up over time, cycle after cycle, layer upon layer. By the 1950s and 60s, the ongoing excavations at Moundville include archaeology students, often led by Walter Jones' friend and colleague, David DeJarnet, who has them out in the trenches, so to speak, learning by doing. Today, the study of Moundville continues, and the baton of leadership has been passed to Walter Jones' own son, Dr. Douglas Jones. We know more about Moundville today than people did 50 years ago. There's a lot yet to be learned because we've only touched a, a fraction of the site. What we are doing now is totally re-curating the archaeological material. And it's a lot of fun to go through some of these boxes that have not been opened for 50 years. It's like we have drifted back in time to the 1930s, and for the first time we're re-looking at these artifacts. And once we take them out of the box, we record the numbers, all the records are still intact, and the thing that we're doing now is encoding all of this data on high-speed computers. The first step in the process of recuration is simply getting all the boxes together. Uh, when we emptied the repository, we had to put the boxes into temporary storage in several locations, and we just get the inventory and find all the boxes and bring them here into the active curation room. Then, box by box, they're open, they're unpacked, they're sorted by basic type of artifact, for example, all of the pottery vessels put together and then all of the materials from individual excavation areas on the site are put together. They're re-inventoried, they're repacked, they're boxed up, the boxes are taken to the repository, and we're simply putting them away for future study. There have been times when the original artifact catalog uh, from the 1930s would indicate that a, a, an artifact was one kind of thing and it would turn out to be something quite different. One of the most interesting examples of that is there's one area on the site that's always been identified as a pottery making area because they have things there that they believe to be kill furniture, uh, wads of clay used in the process of firing the pots. But when we came to that bag of materials here in the collection, we found out that these are actually very crudely and quickly made figurines. When you look at them, they just look like uh, squeezed up pieces of clay, but if you look at them closely, they all have little faces on them. So this is something quite different from just some byproduct of the pottery manufacturing process. The modern era of investigation at Moundville, and one might characterize that as being the last 10 or 15 years, 
uh, is being led by essentially a new breed of archaeologists. Uh, people who have learned from the collections of the past, the work of others, uh, to ask different sorts of questions. Uh, we're much more interested now in, in recreating uh, the details of the lifeways of these Indians uh, and, and in determining also the processes that, that they went through, the social processes to arrive at where they arrived. We're learning things about uh, their nutrition, for example, how healthy they were, learning things about their social organization, their chiefs and so forth, uh, and basically filling in some of these little details that will eventually add up to a picture, a total picture of Mountville society. Whatever we eventually learn as the complete picture of Indian life here at Mountville, there's another question to be answered. What happened to these people? Where did they go? In 1540 A.D., the Spanish conquistador Hernando de Soto came through Alabama, and along the way he encountered chiefs and villages and mounds, but his chroniclers made no mention of a city the size of Moundville. Probably it had been abandoned. Why? How did one of the largest chiefdoms in the southeast, perhaps in the country, just vanish? There are two competing theories about how Moundville may have fallen. One says that the society, society might have fallen apart from the top down, and the other says that the society may have collapsed due to epidemic diseases of European origin. Uh, the first theory is based on the idea that in chiefly societies, chiefs and nobles maintain their distinction with commoners based on their ability to, to show access to exotic goods. And so when that trade dries up, the society collapses uh, because the people can no longer distinguish themselves. Uh, the other theory is based on the fact that beginning in 1492, epidemic diseases spread ahead of the arrival of Europeans. So by the time 1540 came around and DeSoto passed through this area, it may have already been ravaged by diseases, but we know that certainly it was ravaged by diseases after that. And the simple loss of population would have been enough at that time to cause the collapse of Moundville. The short answer to the question of what happened to the Moundville Indians is we just don't know. The mystery still taunts us. Take a walk around this park and you'll know that uh, there's, there's too much here. There's too much history here. We'll never know more than a tiny fraction of it. We have 50 more years of research, not only on Moundville, but on the Mississippian time and Mississippian lifeways in general now. Truth is a function of time is a valid concept. We should know more today than people did 100 years ago. The whole history of scientific investigations of Moundville is one that has evolved where we've asked new questions, where we've learned more bit by bit by bit and struggled hard to put those bits together, always looking back to the generation before us to piece together a little bit at a time a general picture of what life was like a thousand years ago. What do we know? What can we know? And how do we know what we know? The ancient Greek philosophers had a lot of fun with such abstract questions as they tested various assumptions of truth and reality. But when you boil it all down, guess what? They put their big money on just four basic things. Fire, water, air, and earth. These, they said, were the four elements that constituted the world. And earth, as the host of life in the world, they said was a chief element. 2,000 years later, the Indian culture that thrived here at Moundville experienced a close daily relationship with the elements of the world. Earth was especially significant for these Indians, too, and they gave expression to this through the ritual building of mounds. This was an expressive act. The mounds are an aspect of an expressive culture associated with the concepts of world renewal, the Earth Mother, and the womb of humankind. Of course, today's world is a lot different than that of these prehistoric Indians. In today's fast, modern society, we no longer have such close daily contact with nature. 
Yet, in other ways, for each of us, our turn with life is remarkably similar to that of these Indians. Our joys, fears, and beliefs are still bound to the refrains of birth and death and the mysteries of regeneration. This Indian culture rose and fell over a span of roughly a thousand years. As we look now to a new millennium, what will be the story of our culture? Which symbols will we embrace? Which symbols will convey our versions of truth? How will we respect our bond with Mother Earth? Today, explorers are charting new worlds that lie beyond this Earth, out in the far reaches of the universe. Many wonders await discovery in this stellar realm of the future, but many wonders still await discovery in the mysteries of our earthly past. And maybe the grandest wonder is the prospect that all cultures are connected, linked across time and space, by a quest for purpose and a kinship with life that all hold in common. Thanks for joining us on this visit to the Indian Mounds at Moundville, Alabama. If you'd like to write, we'd love to hear from you. The address is Discovering Alabama, Alabama State Museum of Natural History, P.O. Box 870340, University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, 35487.